At engineering schools, pranks are a form of intercollegiate sport. Some say that was the case with the Caltech Cannon Heist, when an underdog school knocked over a national powerhouse with one hell of a prank. But for the 11 conspirators who actually pulled it off, it was more than a prank. It was a mission, a mud mission. It was the holy grail for half the school's history. Sure, Caltech had the nation's highest SAT scores, but MUD had the second highest. And soon, they would have the cannon. It was guarded by Fleming House. You remember them. Only babies pull pranks over spring break. We'd kick your asses if we weren't so busy skiing. We want our cannon back, you little jerks. But I digress. It wasn't the first attempt at stealing the cannon. In the early 70s, a group of students managed to get it loaded onto a pickup truck. Man, I can't believe we got it. What was that? Unfortunately, the axle broke under the weight. Another time, they got the fire hose turned on them. Is that a fire hose? Bam! And an early attempt by Dave Summers and Mark Mogline suggested they needed a strategic plan. How are we getting out of the truck? The 1986 cannon heist took root in that birthplace of daring deeds, Las Vegas. We were... Uh part of an athletic director's conference in, in, in Las Vegas. And we were, Jeff and I were sitting by the pool talking about whether we wanted to steal the cannon or not. Jeff at one point finally just said, you know, I think we've got to do it. We've got to commit to stealing this cannon. And, and so I said, yeah. Apparently, not everything that happens in Vegas stays there. The, the first recon mission, we were uh, setting up beer ball games with uh, with the folks at Caltech and the athletic directors at Caltech we had spoken to and they invited us to come to Caltech. We didn't want to seem too suspicious so we measured Steve Olson in you know, uh, 90 degree angles to the cannon so then we had absolute Olson units. We found the cannon and, and we started taking pictures and we measured every dimension of the cannon in, in Olsen units by how big my arm span was or how high how tall I was. It wasn't you know, just a little, you know, little cannon. It was going to take a whole lot of equipment, much more so than we could possibly just get together on our own. There's no way a multi-thousand pound cannon was going to be rolled off this Caltech campus. And then we decided that, that we had to pick it up and carry it off the campus. That's when we realized that perhaps this was going to take a lot more resources than just the ones that we could marshal all together. Committed now to the heist, Hung and Olsen began to build their crew. And the first person we thought we needed to get involved was, was Dave Summers. He was a student body president uh, and he'd have access to money. You can talk to the guy with budget and you can also have shared responsibility. We knew as student body president if something went wrong he would take the brunt of the responsibilities. Or you can also read that as sharing blame. Dave had gotten a few of his fellow uh, West Dormers involved. David had the cannon on the brain for a while. There were some members of the West Dorm contingent, there were members of the New Dorm contingent. And so there was some back and forth. We had some good ideas, they had some good ideas. So our, this was our planning room, except we had a bar. But pulling off the mission would take more than just flowing kegs and witty concepts. Capturing the cannon would take the exact problem-solving skills that are nurtured here at MUD. We can't just roll on campus and say, oh, well, we're here to steal your cannon. One of the things we did was a, reconnaissance, a second reconnaissance mission to Caltech. We looked to see where the campus police uh, were, how far away it was from the cannon. And, and then we called the police and we told them there was a public disturbance. Uh, yeah, campus security, uh, there's a situation at Fleming House. I think someone's trying to steal the cannon. So we had stop watching and we looked to see how long it would take to, to get there and, and see, give us an idea of how long we really had to steal the cannon. It took about oops, 10 minutes or so for them to, to get there. We had thought we'd pull, pull onto campus, throw some ropes on this cannon and uh, lift it onto the truck and be off in 15 minutes. When you think about it, why would it be so difficult to pick up a cannon, and drop it on a truck, and get away? So we thought maybe it'll take a half. It turned out to take two hours. We had two possible ways that we thought about stealing the cannon. One was to come in really in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., try to get in, steal it, get out before anyone was the wiser. Quiet and quick. I don't think the smash and grab would have worked. Uh, and the second plan was to come in you know, during the middle of the day, 
and go in boldly, um, dressed up as workmen, with uh, with a truck and a forklift, and and just go right in front of their noses and take it there. Don't try and sneak away with it. You got a forklift. Do it. Go in there like you're supposed to take it. So we we compromised on the two plans and decided that we were going to meet at five in the morning and try to get in and out before anyone knew, but but still in the light of day. And then the, the whole uniform idea and the how brazen could we be started to come into play. And at 19, you're still indestructible. You still think it can be done. Their plan was bold, brazen, and bolstered by the mud motto of never fearing the hard problems. But we needed some good um, skill sets, right? People with the proper licenses and skills to operate the heavy machinery. We were 19 and talking about it and thinking, Holy crap, who's going to have that kind of a license in their back pocket? Hernan Santos had actually driven a forklift in a, a summer job. I've driven a, a little forklift. Uh, reality, we got a very big forklift, and even that one wasn't really strong enough for what we were doing. They were in a, one of the corner suites, all gathered around with a bunch of West Dormers and other folks in there. Their uh, original candidate to drive the forklift had second thoughts on it. So I stepped forward. As, as long as someone's going to bail me out, <laughs> I can drive a forklift. I had a commercial driver's license. As a 16-year-old, I was a member of a volunteer fire department. I'd gotten my commercial driver's license, and so I was asked to drive the truck that would deliver the cannon from Caltech to Oregon. I was brought in as a, as a specialist. Joe was a prematurely mature. I was an older student and looked uh, as like a manager type. Some people would say bald. Joe was made the foreman uh, of our crew. As a good manager, I would stand and watch. He was a fantastic image of a construction foreman. I worked my way through college as a commercial fisherman, um, so I, I knew how to handle ropes and, and you know, uh, lift things and pull things. We all had unique skills that we brought together and collectively were, were able to pull off a mission that a lot of people, I think, believed would never succeed. They had the team. Now, all they needed was the tools. Now, where do you get a flatbed truck and a giant forklift, uh, and how do you get it to Pasadena? It would be hard for, you know, a bunch of 20-year-old kids to show up and try to rent these big pieces of equipment. We were very fortunate that um, we had some help from alumni. They needed a little bit of advice on maybe how, how to proceed, and also, once that was decided, where to get the equipment. Lend on some heavy equipment to students is a little amazing, right? Uh, we sort of vouched for them, and uh, they were able to rent the equipment. How will we convince people that we'll need the paperwork, or <laughs> Byrne will have to step up with some, you know, darkroom magic. You know, in 1986, making a purchase order was not as easy as it would be now. Um, there were a number of us that had some access to the paperwork that would be required. I was doing my clinic for JPL and uh, as a result they had gotten these uh, purchase orders and work order forms from Caltech which is affiliated with JPL in some way. Spent hours in a dark room in between photographing letterhead and making copies and coming up with a fake triplicate order that looked like from uh, Caltech ordering the cannon to be picked up and claimed by the H&M salvage company. So we'd had the work orders, the Caltech work orders made up and we had our plan of what we were going to do but we didn't have any work clothes and so Jeff was a member of the ROTC. He had a number of army uniforms uh, that were a pale blue that would go off as, as work clothes. I thought that would be a good uniform and I had a lot of them so we would all kind of look the same. So whoever was around um, on Friday afternoon before the heist um, was handed uh, Jeff's work clothes and they became the workmen. A week prior to the heist, they saw a need for a fail safe should the mission go terribly wrong time came the week before we were going to steal the cannon, uh, we thought that we should let somebody on campus of official capacity know uh, what was going on. And, and Jeff really trusted Mr. McKelvey. Oddly enough, he was my boxing instructor. And, and so he talked to him and Vice President McKelvey promised that he would bail us out of jail if, if anything went wrong. Yeah, if you're going to go down, at least you're not like the Mission Impossible team. It would be disavowed. Their bailout guaranteed, they planned an early morning raid on Caltech. But first, they had to get through a night which was made more tense by something I've come to call the curse of the forklift. But what do you do with a forklift uh, overnight? Scouted around, found some road construction that was being done uh, some partway between 
the, the rental place and uh, the Caltech campus. Mm -hmm. They had already uh, finished their work for the day and had left and uh, they had a couple pieces of equipment just you know, parked out there and we just pulled our forklift in and Tamiancevich uh, was tasked with driving the forklift and as he turned a corner well, I whacked a car on the street the guy in the BMW was not amused at all. It's like a $1,500 bill that we had to pay for because one of the forks went clean through a door. There was a problem with the steering, the hydraulic system. We just sort of thought maybe Tom didn't drive very well. Unaware the forklift would impede their mission, the crew spent a restless night in anticipation of the heist. It was effectively an all-nighter for, for most of us, uh, which is a pretty familiar territory for, for most mutters, I think. We gathered very early. We headed out to Caltech, our intent to be there on a Saturday morning when most of the Caltech students would have been asleep. We brought in some students, or some of our students, to pose as Caltech students as a little a social psychology uh, experiment. Uh, those of us uh, dressed up as, as the students, we, uh, we took Jeff's car and we parked it right in front of the gate that the police used to get on campus. Our two of them were having catch with a football. Uh, and another was sitting there reading a book, all within sight of the cannon. Stood about 50 feet away, and just uh, yawned a lot and played a little catch, and uh, acted like it was a big thing that uh, these guys were taking a forklift to this giant cannon on and off campus. We had a truck that we left in the parking lot uh, for transport of the cannon. We had a small truck with us that had the, the tools that we would need to relocate our prize. And the plan was to just have the forklift drive into the parking lot and put it on the on the truck. It took a lot of maneuvering, a lot of manual work to get that forklift in place. The steering was barely working, <laughs> so we had guys out there twisting the wheels manually, trying to trying to get the thing in position. I saw you know, people sticking their hands in there, moving the wheels around. And it became a concern to us that this might be our downfall. It would be something that would consume so much time, it looked so shoddy that campus security would become wise to our uh, non-professional activity. Burn Sanford came along to photograph uh, the entire thing. This, I, in my opinion, was probably the ballsiest component of this. So not only are we going to steal your cannon, but we're going to photograph the entire process. I, it's about 20 minutes gotten around, I found um, an outside hallway in the Fleming Hall, which is with the hall on the cannon, that was perfect. There was a freshman who came up and from the, who lived in the dorm and started asking him questions uh, and, you know, t regaling us about the history of attempts to steal the cannon. How comes this freshman from one of the rooms behind me? And um, he calls security. Within 15 minutes of rolling on campus, the campus security came on and we thought, oh crap, we're busted. So the security did work his way across. He talked to maybe the guys on the periphery. And he had uh, dumped down English, I said, it's just my job, the foreman's Joe, I don't know what we're up to. We're doing what we're supposed to do, yeah, you know, whatever, we're just here, we're doing our job, leave us alone. Uh, said that we have uh, a, an order, basically a work order, to uh, take the cabin for refurbishment. It's, it's a can, it gets cleaned, whatever. And I said, oh, I have some paperwork, do you want to see the paperwork? And the guys were basically, oh no, no, that's cool. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I have to say, the security at Caltech, if they were, if they were sort of fooled by it, these guys had to be really just very convincing. And I think the reason that they were accepting of the whole deal was that we had very large forklift, we had a large truck, um, everybody was in, you know, basically coordinated outfit, you know, with I forget it was blue shirt, pants, and hard hat. And, and so uh, it looked legit. After that, the, the crowds got larger and larger. And, and then there was one very animated person who came in and said, They can't steal our cannons. Somebody's got to call the police. And a student right next to her said, I know. We already called them. And they say they got all their papers in order, so there's nothing we can do. In order to remove the cannon from its location, we positioned the forklift over the cannon and use chains to secure the cannon to the tongs of the forklift. It took forever to pick the cannon up. We headed down a paved path towards the parking lot, but soon we encountered a low-hanging tree branch. We tried to go under it, but that wasn't working too well. The next option we had was to try to maneuver around the tree branch. Unfortunately, as soon as the, the 
forklift was maneuvered off the path that immediately sunk in the mud, and we were stuck. So I went to the parking lot, got the truck, and drove right down the middle of campus, got the truck positioned right under the forklift, we lowered the cannon onto the truck, and once the forklift was unloaded, we were able to again move it. And then everybody kind of transitioned from the nervousness and the figuring it out into, oh my god, it worked. <laughs> And we're just gonna get in this truck and we're gonna drive away. And we're driving down 210. And I think Rosser and I were in this car and I'm looking at him like, can that cannon come off the truck? That was certainly a nightmare scenario of having the cannon uh, slip off the truck onto the 210 and crash something that would have been a very bad ending. After I left, that the forklift was removed from the mud. I had to go and then return the forklift uh, to the rental place. I couldn't just leave it on campus uh, since there was an alum on the hook. He successfully departed the campus and left behind a Harvey Mudd calling card, an empty beer keg, and a Harvey Mudd t-shirt. When we got to campus, we all jumped on the back of the truck and uh, Greg drove it right up onto the sidewalk and right through the middle of campus. We honked the horn a few times and people came out. Literally, there's 200 people out there yelling and screaming. Alumni from the 70s were calling within hours saying, I can't believe you got it. I'm sending you money, buy a keg. It was a huge part. Whenever you talk about, you know, whether it's long tall glasses or it's gonna be a, a you know, a West a TQ night or so, those parties are planned, you know, heavily in advance. And this was very much a in the moment. Shortly after we arrived on campus, a number of Caltech students started to arrive as well. I think the empty beer keg and the Harvey Mudd t-shirt were clues they quickly put together along with their missing cannon. They were pissed because they realized they had just been smoked in terms of college pranks. We were successfully able to lower the cannon into position between East and North dorms. Once we put it into place in that circle, it just looked like that circle was designed for that cannon. The Caltech students, although distraught about the loss of their cannon, were unable in their small numbers to immediately take any action to recover it from the 500 students that uh, were celebrating its delivery. The successful heist and Caltech's reaction soon attracted the press. The media picked us up as a story, so we got a lot of media play. The LA Times came out and did a, a photo shoot with Jeff Hong and I, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, local media um, picked it up. The Mudraker, the student paper at the time, ran this just huge banner headline that just said, Victory. The story even aired on NBC. Famous Caltech pranksters have been upstaged by rival Harvey Mudd College. Not yes, yeah, it's true. Really? And the Caltech students are vowing to take revenge. Joe Rico has both sides to this story. The Caltech Cannon, proud symbol of the school known for its science and engineering. It's gone, vanished. When it was here, it stood 12 feet high, 17 feet long, weighed about 5,400 pounds, just like the one at Claremont's Harvey Mudd College, 25 miles away. Actually, Harvey Mudd students say they liberated the cannon from Caltech last Saturday in broad daylight. 11 mudders dressed as construction workers bluffed their way on campus. The heist was based not on technology, but guts. Our whole ploy was probably based on the fact that we had to ignore everybody. We had to just pretend like we were uh, um, people that were hired to take the thing and, and it was our job. And, uh -huh. um, if anybody asked any questions, we said, well, go talk to Joe. This is the first shot that hit, I would say. There have been a couple, a couple attempts in the past that didn't quite come off, but this is the first successful one. And the cannonball is now in Caltech's court. And we plan to get it back in the near future in a very spectacular fashion. The cannon. When you study its history, Caltech really has no reason to be upset. After all, it was never theirs. They stole it, uh, liberated it from a one-time military academy in Pasadena. So for now, here's mud in your eye. Joe Rico, Channel 4 News, Claremont. We were all just consumed with, with, with keeping it. Frosh jumping in and saying, you know, we're going to sleep by this cannon. You know, we were paranoid that Caltech was going to come and steal it back. There were a couple of attempts that I know of to take the cannon, or at least parts of it. One of them was an attempt by some students to convince us that the wheels of the cannon were in such a decrepit state, deteriorated, that needed to be restored. There was a rumor as well that the Marines were going to use a helicopter to airlift the cannon 
off of the Harvey Mudd campus. Caltech had basically threatened to just dis disrupt finals, uh, that basically they were going to come and nobody's going to get any sleep and no one's going to be able to study. That was sort of the beginning of it sort of dawning on all of us, really like, well, you can't keep this thing. The Harvey Mudd student body, and by this time the alumni, the administration, and the faculty, and then decided it was time to return it. The real prompt for that was a letter from Marvin Goldberger, the president of Caltech, to Ken Baker, the president of Harvey Mudd. I must congratulate the Harvey Mudd students on the capture of the Fleming House cannon. Now that the prank is over, I would like to ask that the cannon be returned to Caltech. One day Dave came in and he said, hey, we're thinking we're going to gift wrap this thing. So the cannon was boxed up. It looked like a huge present on the back of a truck. So we spent, you know, a few hours building this box and wrapping paper around it. The barrel was coming out of the box that we had built and uh, was wrapped with, uh, with streamers uh, in the Harvey Mudd colors. And a copy of that fine leather book every one of us signed as we entered the Harvey Mudd community was made. Every page was copied and they were all pasted onto the, the side of this present. It said something along the lines of to Caltech with love from Harvey Mudd and it had the signature of every alum who ever entered the Harvey Mudd community. A Caltech raid party met the truck on the 210, visibly upset by the decorative gesture. They even wrapped it in a gift box, so I mean, what else could, you know, how much nicer could it be? The highway hijinks was nixed by facilities director Larry Hartwick, who sent both students back to their respective campuses and delivered the cannon himself. When you guys stole the cannon, I was managing the infrared processing and uh, analysis center uh, on Caltech campus. So here I was, an alumni graduate working for Caltech, and on the outside of my door I posted the article that showed how you guys were great at taking the cannon of it. So, well done. I remember something that we all knew we'd remember forever. The emotions uh, were really just tremendous as, as, as strong, you know, up there with the birth of my children. It was done in light of and hopefully the spirit of the honor code that you know, pe you know, people wouldn't get hurt, but property wouldn't be hurt. We took it seriously, and I think we did it with, uh, with honor. I would strongly encourage that current and future students of Harvey Mudd continue to pursue pranks as a, as a method of learning, a method of demonstrating that the, the skills they're being taught in classes are not entirely academic, but in fact are practical. Sometimes you try, it work, doesn't work out, sometimes it works out, and you end up with a great story at the end. Few can forget the story of HMC's 11.